They gave me Vicodin after my knee surgery. They kept prescribing it, so I kept taking it. I didn't know it would be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. Hello, and welcome to Cleveland Anonymous, a program dedicated to educating you about our justice system and the people behind it. In this episode, we will talk with former Cleveland Municipal Court Judge Michael Ryan, who is currently a Cuyahoga County Juvenile Court Judge. Uh, welcome to the program, Judge Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Patton. It's, uh, it's wonderful um, for me to be here, an honor for me to be here. Um, when you said you were going to talk to a former retired or retired judges, I was like, I am retired <laughs> from Cleveland Municipal Court. I didn't think about that, but uh, having, you know, be, been so young um, and then having been in Municipal Court for some time, and then I did have to resign in order to take the seat with uh, Juvenile Court, so I guess I am retired and definitely former judge. Former, former <laughs> Cleveland Municipal Court. How many years were you with the Cleveland Municipal Court? Seven years. Seven years. Seven wonderful years as a judge and of course a uh, number of years as a magistrate as well so a total of 11 and a half for Cleveland Municipal Court. Well, there are a lot of people who talk about you over in the building. They, they know you're doing well at Juvenile but tell me we want to talk about your memories of Cleveland Municipal Court for first. Okay. And let's get let's get started. How did you like it and what did you do there? Uh, I had some very fond memories, still have some very fond memories of being at Cleveland Municipal Court. Um, I actually started there uh, as a prosecuting attorney um, and I worked several courtrooms, uh, uh, Judge Stokes, uh, to name one in particular. I was with Judge Kilbane, um, Judge, I think Judge Keogh. I uh, did a rotation with Judge Jasper, did a rotation with uh, Judge Jones, Larry Jones. So uh, I had uh, almost um, you know, a full rotation with all the judges. Uh, and then um, I left uh, to go uh, to um, the city of Cleveland's uh, public, uh, public safety department. Uh, then I came back and did some more work as a prosecutor and then went into private practice. Uh, and eventually I was hired as a magistrate. And I was, I was, I think the youngest person they ever appointed. I was only 30. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, it, it was, I think it was a shock to some people, but not to the judges because they knew my reputation. Um, they knew the, the skill that I possessed to, to be um, um, a, a good jurist, uh, at least a, a judicial apprentice for them. And um, so that's where I started off at Munich Court as, as a magistrate. I have an opportunity to sit in the seat of judgment, preside over cases on behalf of the judge. I did a lot of personal dockets on behalf of the judges. I actually sat for, um, I mean, presided over civil jury trials, so the judges had a lot of confidence in me, uh, notwithstanding my, my youthfulness. Uh, they also, but they knew the experience that I possessed, and so they, they, were, they were pretty uh, confident I could come and do a good job. Um, I did a lot of memos for the judges, wrote a lot of memos, did a lot of research, and I was honored to have them take some of that research and the writing and put it into their own decisions. Um, and so that, that gave me the confidence to believe that, you know, well, maybe one day I could sit in the seat as a judge and, and do a, a fairly decent job. Um, my memories of the court are, um, are um, wonderful in that I got a lot of experience uh, as um, uh, a magistrate, um, but uh, I was able to carry that over as a judge. Um, I've had um, many uh, situations as a, as a judge of Cleveland Supreme Court where I've been very proud of uh, the work that, that we've done to help turn people's lives around. Um, I have memories, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of different judges, uh, in particular uh, Judge Ronald Adrian, uh, who was a mentor to me, um, as well as Judge uh, Larry Jones, uh, who also was an, another, another mentor for me. And I talk about those two just because they're both African-American men, and um, I try to um, guide my, my, 
my practice as a judge after what I saw them doing. I, I observed them not only um, as a prosecutor, a prosecuting attorney as well as a defense attorney, but I observed them from the bench and I saw them being fair and firm uh, in their decisions, uh, which left an indelible mark on me when I was uh, given the opportunity to make those same, um, same decisions. Uh, judge uh, Sean Gallagher sticks out as well, uh, Judge Robert uh, Triazzi. Um, judge Robert Triazzi, uh, the reason why I talk about him is he was a mentor as well. He's the one that actually um, encouraged me to get more involved in domestic violence issues um, on the professional side. I already had um, some um, experience there per um, personally, um, but he saw the passion I had in prosecuting those cases and at times defending those cases as well. And, and so um, he was like, well, we're starting this teen domestic violence workshop. <coughs> Uh, we want you to become and be a facilitator. So I had an opportunity to go and talk to young men about domestic violence matters. <clears throat> and so uh, I appreciate uh, the uh, guidance that he's provided, that he provided. And then Sean Gallagher. Well, let, let me ask oh, you I'm something sorry. about this, Shazi. <laughs> um, you're talking about domestic violence. Had they established the domestic violence docket by the time you were a judge? Yes. In fact, Judge Adrian and I were the two who started the uh, dedicated domestic violence docket. He took one, um, one large document and I took the other one. Uh, but it was the, I think it was a brainchild of Judge Trazi and Judge Adrian, but I came on when Judge Trazi was leaving. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, you know, because of my, my background in domestic violence in terms of the teen domestic violence facilitator and also helping uh, Judge Adrian with um, his book on Ohio domestic violence. I was one of the individuals that helped him edit it every year when I was there at, um, at Cleveland Muni Court. And so um, that gave me some experience on uh, domestic violence issues now, a little bit more. Why did they start a specialized docket for domestic violence issues? The, the reason was because he wanted to find a way to try to reduce the amount of fatalities involving domestic violence. Um, Judge Adrian felt that, as, as well as most people who, um, who are educated in this field, that if we can find a specialized way of dealing with these cases, maybe we can reduce the amount of people that are killed uh, when it's um, loved ones or um, significant others who are causing uh, the harm or the, or, or the death. And, and so that's why, and with the dedicated domestic violence docket, there were dedicated uh, detectives and sergeants uh, as well as prosecutors who prosecuted these cases. There were more resources uh, that went into ensuring that these cases went to, um, uh, went to the end and in terms of completion of the cases and, and saw a reduction in cases being um, dismissed and dropped for, for one of prosecution. Um, there was more, uh, more evidence-based um, programs provided to those who were found um, guilty of those offenses, and that was the D Domestic Intervention Education tra and Training Program, which is DIET. So we actually had probation officers who were specially trained to complete this, uh, the, the, um, the programs and help these individuals um, uh, move from being abusers to individuals who are um, no longer um, reacting violently to um, having frustrations with, um, with uh, significant others. So, that was that was the uh, the impetus behind uh, establishing the dedicated domestic violence docket. Oh, good, good, and it's still going on with three judges dedicated at this point in time. Two when you get started, so it's grown since you since you. I, I'm I'm glad to hear that because I think when we started, there weren't that many districts who were involved, so we can only do um, two judges. But I think with the expansion of more districts being uh, dedicated to having those cases sent. It, there was a need then to have another jurist uh, be involved in the dedicated domestic violence docket. Um, I, I don't know whether or not uh, it's had any impact in terms of reducing the amount of fatalities. Uh, I would hope that it has, um, but um, you know, I, I just don't know what the empirical evidence says. We'll, we'll get that information and review it, and uh, it's the end of the year, so we're putting those statistics together right now in the court, and we'll have to make a report and the annual journal that Wonderful. comes out, and also down in Columbus. They want to know what we're doing this year. 
That's true. I think we have a report due in Columbus. Now, you mentioned earlier you got out and talked to young folks. Yes. While you were a magistrate and a judge. And a judge. Um, well, who did you go see and what, what was your message? Um, my, I, I, I went primarily, um, primarily to the, the middle schools and to the high schools through the, uh, the Teen Domestic Violence Workshop and just talking about healthy, unhealthy relationships, talking about the consequences for engaging in domestic violence situations. Also, giving kids the opportunity um, to freely talk about some of the situations that they were experiencing at home um, and, and things that they were experiencing in their own relationships with other um, significant others. And um, so that was one thing that I discussed. But there was another thing that I discussed. I talked about my own uh, upbringing uh, as a way to try to inspire and motivate a lot of the young people who are in our community. And not just the city of Cleveland, I just didn't limit it there. I was uh, throughout the county. Um, so I talked about, you know, being the son of a teenage drug addicted mother. Um, I talked about living in, you know, almost all of the, the neighborhoods throughout the city of Cleveland, more particularly the Longwood Projects. Uh, I talked to them about uh, experiencing violence uh, as a child in the, in, in the form of watching my, uh, my stepdad, who I thought was my father, um, brutalize my mother from the time I was four until I was 11. I would saw him pick her up and slam her. I would see him strangle her. I would see him punch her and slap her, all with my sister and I screaming and crying for him to stop. Um, I would see the results of those beatings from my mom having black eyes and busted lips. Um, I would see her uh, trying to cover everything up with makeup and sunglasses and turtlenecks in the summertime. It was just um, horrendous what you know I, we were going through. And I'll also talk about how my, my parents, they abused uh, drugs. Um, both of them were addicted to heroin, so that meant that my sister and I would be neglected. Um, we wouldn't get enough food to eat. Our, uh, we didn't have a lot of clothing. I was washing my clothes out with soap that you normally bathe with. I would tell the kids about that, or fighting roaches for crackers, or we were living in Longwood and talking about how school was a refuge for me because it was a place that I could learn and really, um, and get nourishment and, and actually um, have hope that I could survive some of the challenges I was experiencing at home. And I, I talked about them about being able to overcome uh, adverse situations uh, because in, despite all those things I was uh, experiencing, I was still able to focus on my education. Um, I made that a priority because uh, I knew that that would be the one thing that would propel me out of all of the misery, out of the poverty, um, out of the hopelessness that I was seeing around me. Now, um, now you, you are ju you're a juvenile court judge now. Now, yes. You survived some adversity <laughs> growing up. Yes. Most children you see in juvenile court don't survive that. And we see the results in, in, in municipal court from the, those rough childhood beginnings. Um, What's being done? At our level? Yeah. We are trying to do some, uh, I think, um, uh, innovative uh, activities to try to help or, or at least initiate some innovative uh, programs to help our youth. Um, a lot of kids um, may not have that um, same ability that my sister and I possess. You know, because my mom died when I was 13. Uh, she was 28 from her drug use. And I was living with my step-grandmother. She died a year after my mom. And then had to go live with one of my step-aunts and then another aunt and so forth. So, you know, going from uh, 11 schools from kindergarten to 10th grade, I, you know, overcame those challenges. And like you said, there's a lot of kids who are unable to do that. And so I think um, we try to find the core problem behind these kids' um, finding themselves involved in uh, delinquent behavior uh, and try to, uh, to um, repair that core problem. Uh, and then if we can get that core problem fixed, maybe then we can also have a be better outcomes for these kids. So we're trying things like uh, um, an, in an intervention uh, center, wherein when kids are first introduced to the juvenile justice system, 
via an arrest, um, via placement in the detention center. Uh, we're trying to find out what services this, this child needs. So there's an assessment being done immediately uh, at that point, and then services being offered as opposed to waiting until a kid is adjudicated delinquent to getting those services offered. Um, so we also have um, programs like mentoring. We have programs that we call MST, multi-systemic uh, treatment, uh, and we have FFT, family functional therapy, which gets the family involved to try to heal any issues or, or, or um, problems that may exist between family members that may be causing the kids to act uh, in an appropriate fashion. Now, um, you, you somehow overcame those barriers. Is there something you can attribute to making your turnaround successful? You, you said you, you acknowledge education being important early on. How many different elementary schools did you go to? Oh, my. <laughs> Let's see. Um, uh, one, I went to one for kindergarten, it was a different school, then first grade was a different school, second grade was a different school, third grade was a different school, was along with elementary school, um, then I went to Tremont Elementary School, uh, then from Tremont back to uh, Miles Park. So six different elementary schools. And most psychiatrists will say that's not a good childhood upbringing. No, and they would say that, you know, based on those uh, occurrences, I shouldn't be where I am today. Yes, yes. But yeah. what, what, what motivated you? Um, what got you to say you're not going to be caught up in this? I was tired of, I guess part of me, is I'm, I'm a competitor. I'm, I'm an athlete. And so I was tired of losing when it came to situations that uh, I couldn't control. So things that I could control, I put all my effort into that. I could control whether or not I got an A on the test, whether or not I studied, whether or not I behaved appropriately in school and outside of school. Uh, I, I could control um, who I associated with. Um, I could control where I put my passion. Um, I could control whether or not I reacted violently to a situation that I was frustrated with. Um, and because I did that, I was able to excel at things I could control. And the things I couldn't, I just left that up to faith. I, you know, I'm also um, a, a staunch believer in, in God, and, and I'm a member of my, my, I'm a deacon at my church on a trustee board. And so I just felt that things I can't control, I'll put it in God's hands. And so the, my faith, along with uh, a laser focus on my education um, and just this desire to win, I, I think those are the three things that help propel me to where I am today. Okay. Now, you went to college. Yes. Okay. Where did you go to college, and did you get there with somebody's uh, advice or somebody's help or assistance? Uh, I went to Allegheny College, which is a small liberal arts school. Um, about an hour and 45 minutes uh, east, of, um, east of Cleveland. And I went there uh, actually because my high school football coach, he coached there. He told me about the school, and he told me, actually, don't go there. Don't attend the school. <laughs> but I didn't like him too much, you know, because of some of the things he had done. So I said, well, if he's saying don't go there, maybe there's something to this. And so I actually took a, uh, a visit to the school, and I loved it. Um, it was a very small school. The student-to-professor student to, uh, ratio was like 15 to 1, and in some classes, 10 to 1. And I wanted that small environment where you can get a lot of one-on-one -on -one treatment with, from the um, professors. And I knew about Allegheny's um, academic reputation. Now, um, Allegheny is a small college in the countryside. Yes. Little, yeah. co little college town. Meadville, uh, Meadville Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. Now, we'll come back to that in a moment. Right now, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back shortly to move on with Judge Ryan with some more conversation. Thank you.
Welcome back to Cleveland Honors. Today we're talking with former Cleveland Municipal Court Judge and current Cuyahoga County Juvenile Court Judge, Michael J. Ryan. Michael, we were talking about Allegheny College and um, you, you got there out of Cleveland. Yes. Uh, graduated from what high school? Cleveland Heights High School. Okay. And um, now, your mother died, you raised with your grandmother, moving around still. Your life wasn't stable. No. How could you, many students would say, how can they afford to go to college? Hmm. Did you take out loans or? I did take out some loans uh, when I went to Allegheny. Allegheny uh, was about $15,000 average a year. So at the end of the four years, uh, total education for me uh, was 60 thousand dollars but I only pay I only took out six thousand dollars in loans um, I was fortunate to receive um, Allegheny grant which is uh, something that's offered based on merit uh, for students I also received um, the Pell grant um, I also was um, a fortunate recipient of a scholarship the Peter J Lewis scholarship I received that coming out of Cleveland Heights High School and then when I arrived at Allegheny after the conclusion of my freshman year, um, they brought me into the um, financial aid office. I thought I was in trouble, and they said, no, we've been watching you, and, and we've been ob observing your grades, and we just received a uh, substantial amount of money, and um, the individual is an alum, and she wants to offer a scholarship. And so, they, I said to me, and they said, yes, we're going to offer you this scholarship. And so that helped defray the cost of only, I left Allegheny on them $6,000 out of, um, out of 60. So okay. congratulations. Uh, yeah, that, thank you. Thank yeah, you. That was a good way to go to school. What was your major? My major was English with a minor in political science. And there's, there's a unique story behind that. And it's actually the reason why I even uh, became in, um, interested in becoming a lawyer. Uh, I actually went to Allegheny College because they had an education program where you can get your master's degree in five years and your teacher certificate. And so, you know, for me, you know, school meant a lot for me. Um, teachers had a huge impact over, on me. And so I wanted to do the same thing for other kids. Um, and so I was really attracted to Allegheny because of that program, as well as uh, playing football for them at the Division Three level, where they didn't offer uh, <laughs> athletic scholarships. <laughs> um, but so when I got to Allegheny, though, my freshman year, they terminated the um, the program. You know, they were no longer offering the master's program because Allegheny um, that was the only. Um, graduate degree that they offered and so they wanted to move away from offering any graduate degrees um, and so I was like oh what am I gonna do I said I love the school I love the atmosphere um, I love my professors uh, but I came here for the purpose of becoming a, a teacher and so I went to my um, advisor and she was like don't leave uh, she did not want me to leave the school um, this was like, uh, this was the, the first semester. And I said, okay. She said, what I want you to do is to take some other classes uh, and see if anything piques your interest. And I took a class called Civil Liberties. Now for me, I had an aversion to, to the law because um, my, my biological father, I didn't meet him until I was 22 because he was incarcerated in prison uh, for bank robbery. And um, my stepdad, my, who I thought was my dad, he wound up going to prison when I was in um, fifth grade, my, the summer of my fifth grade year, going to, into my sixth grade year. My sister and I were in court when they took him to prison. And so I didn't want anything to do with the law. I didn't want to become a lawyer. I had no visions of becoming a judge. But after I took that class, and it was um, Professor Robert Seddick, I'll never forget him, um, he showed me a different side of the law. And I developed a passion for the law because I saw that it didn't hurt people, it helped people. And so from after taking that class, I went back to the advice. I said, what do I need to do to become a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> and so she brought in one of her other advisees who just happened to be a pre-law um, student at Allegheny. And he was in his senior year. And he told me, 
if he had to do it all over again, he would take more writing courses. I was not the best student in English. That was not my best subject in high school. And so I was like, oh, goodness, writing? And he said, yes, it will help you. Um, and so I started taking a lot of writing courses. And then when I looked up to declare a major, I had all these writing courses. So English was just the most appropriate choice. But I made sure um, I um, supported that with the poli sci uh, courses, because those are the okay. ones I was getting the better grades in. Okay. And so that, that's how I wound up being a, a, an English major uh, with a minor in political science. Now, where did you go to law school? I came home to go to law school, uh, Clear Marshall College of Law. Okay. Now, how long between college and law school? Right after Right after. So college, you started uh, and kept going. You knew yeah, what you wanted to do. I, I knew what I was uh, aiming for, what my goal was. And I didn't want to stop because I thought if I did, um, then I may not continue. Um, in fact, I, had, I was offered a job with State Farm uh, Insurance Company as a claims adjuster right out of college. And I had a choice between that and going to law school. And um, I had a conversation with my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. And she was like, you know, do what your heart tells you to do. Um, I said, I'm not going to have a lot of money. <laughs> She was working, and so that, that was fine, and um, I, I decided to come home and go to law school. Okay, okay. Now, how hard was law school? Law school was challenging only because of the pressure that they put on you your first year. Um, you know, from uh, Professor Dean White, oh, yeah, Dean White, but I was a professor, Fred White at the time, he was like, he says, you know, when we first started uh, law school, he says, turn to your right, turn to your left. That, those persons won't be here when you graduate. Um, and I was telling the other people to put blinders on that were next to me. Because <laughs> I wanted to be here. But, you know, it was a lot of preparation in terms of uh, being prepared for those cases uh, uh, and uh, being prepared to discuss those cases, to discuss those cases. Uh, public speaking wasn't an issue for me. I had, did public speaking from, you know, from sixth grade to um, uh, middle school, high school. I, I, so that wasn't an issue. It was just preparing for those cases and understanding um, the, the complexity of some of those of the law. The, the, the public school system prepared you to go to college. Yes. College got you ready for law school. Definitely. You got out past the bar. Yes. Now, did you start immediately after the bar passage with the court, or did you work someplace else? Uh, I know you were with a firm for a while. I actually, um, I was a, a law clerk with the city of Cleveland on the uh, civil side when I passed the bar. Okay. And I was hoping that they would have a position available for me to be assistant, um, uh, chief, chief assistant director, I forgot what the, the title was. Uh, but just one of the associates that, for the city of Cleveland's uh, civil division. But they didn't have um, any openings, but the prosecutor's office did. And I had worked there as a mediator before I worked as a law clerk for the civil division. So right after I passed the bar, I called them up and uh, Carolyn Watts Allen, she was the chief prosecutor then. And she says, Mike, we have a spot for you. Okay. And so I started as an assistant prosecuting attorney for the city of Cleveland. Now, before I met you, I had heard about you from some school teachers in Cleveland. Oh, wow. <laughs> and you had apparently been, impre you had impressed them telling your story and reaching out to their students. They were all elementary school teachers. Um, so I know you had a good story and you reached out. And juvenile court, is this where you want to stay? Are you happy there? I am ecstatic about being at juvenile court. Um, I love you know my staff. Uh, they really helped me um, provide the the help for the young people and the families that come before the court. Uh, you know I had uh, other opportunities while I was at Munich Court. People would you know come to me about running for this seat or running for that seat, and I said, well, the one seat that um, I really hope that people would uh, help me uh, obtain is you know to be a juvenile court judge when that time came. And so when the opportunity uh, availed itself, I, you know, went full throttle for this uh, position. I, I love what I do. Um, I, I enjoy uh, having an opportunity to impact the lives of young people who think that, you know, their life is over, that, they, that they've been derailed. 
I, I also, you know, uh, unfortunately have to make kids accountable as well when they are um, found to have committed egregious acts. And, you know, that's, that's part of the job. But I really like when kids get a second chance, get an opportunity to turn things around, when families get a second chance, an opportunity to turn things around. Because I'm not just involved with delinquency matters. I'm, I'm really um, involved with uh, cases where parents have been accused of abusing, neglecting, or, or the kids are dependent. And, and so in almost all the situations that come before me, I see kids who are in similar situations that I was in when I was younger, either on the delinquency side or on the abuse, neglect, and dependency side. So I, I really, really like what I'm doing. Uh, but I won't say, you know, um, um, that uh, I won't ever think about doing something different. I'm young. I'm, I'm 47 years old. And so I, I know there's, I, I pray there's a lot of uh, life ahead of me and a lot of opportunity for me to uh, advance in, into, the, um, into uh, the judicial field. But right now, I'm happy where I am. Good. Now, you, you're, you're a young author also. You've written yeah. a book. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, how long did it take to put that book together? Uh, a long time. I remember the conversations that you and I had when I first uh, became a judge, and you asked me, was I ever going to pen a book regarding, you know, my life story? And I said, yeah, whenever I get the time, judge. But it took, you know, time for me being on the bench at Muni Court all the way up until um, about three years of being at juvenile court because I would have to sacrifice weekends, um, uh, time when I was home from work, uh, vacation time to actually um, write. Uh, and so it took about almost six to seven years to get it to where I was satisfied. And I'm still not satisfied with where it is, but um, the individual who helped me self-publish it, they were like, okay, judge, at some point you've got to say this is it and finalize it and, and get it out into the, um, into the community. So. Um, I was, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the, the product that we put, to get, we put out, but, uh, you know, I know we could do something more to it. I want more people to have access to it. Um, and the title of it is The Least Likely from the Housing Projects to the Courthouse. And I have many, I've purchased a couple of copies. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate and, it. And uh, got good reviews. <laughs> Wonderful. And, but but I, I know the story. Yes, you I've do. I've seen you yes. grow up from uh, in the municipal court and move on to the common pleas court and juvenile division, and, and hopefully you're happy and doing what needs to be done to help some people. Uh -uh. Um, but but helping people, we call Cleveland Municipal Court the People's Court, um, and, and helping people. Now, what what other specialized dockets were you involved with when you were at Cleveland Muni? Uh, I was involved with Get on Track for a while. Uh, I really, I really liked that because... Well, explain Get on Track. Get on Track. Uh, I think that was the um, brainchild of Judge Emanuela Groves and Judge Lauren Moore. I know that you were heavily involved in that as well. Um, and Get on Track was an opportunity to have uh, individuals who were found guilty of you know, some minor offenses, and I think we also then started to allow even some of uh, the more um, high-level offenses to, to be involved in that because of the, uh, the positive outcomes from individuals who were involved in Get On Track. But what I saw with Get On Track was that this was a structured program uh, for individuals whose life was just unstable and I think chaotic. And so this, this gave them this took away the excuses that they had been making about not getting an education, about not doing the job training, about not obtaining a job, about not staying away from criminal activity. Um, there were reviews where people were held accountable when they weren't responsive to the requirements on, on the Get On Track program. Um, there were dedicated volunteers uh, with respect to the Get On Track program in terms of the GED program. Uh, to the work training program, to uh, doing resumes for individuals. Um, I, I thought it was uh, a wonderful uh, program that, that helped individuals. Um, I know Cleveland Municipal Court has to be reactive um, to situations, but here is, they saw an opportunity to help a wide range of individuals and keep them out of the, out of the justice system. I talk about get on track 
in, in a way when I'm talking to uh, some of the kids because we have the resources uh, in juvenile court because there's a requirement for kids to continue um, with their education necessarily when they're 18. But we have those resources for them. But I, t I tell them, since, you know, education is imperative. I said, because what I would see far too often uh, when I was a, an adult uh, court judge is that a lot of the individuals, the majority of the individuals who were involved in the justice system, criminal justice system, on the wrong side, they didn't have an education, high school education. And so I make it a priority with me for kids who are found delinquent that are close to graduating from high school, that they get a GED or they get their diploma uh, if I give them the privilege of probation before I take them off of probation. Because that's, that's one barrier that I can remove and, I, and, th and thus um, reduce the probability of you being involved in the adult um, justice system. And, and I enjoy um, get on track for the, a number of reasons, but I had a professor at Howard Law School mm -hmm. who asked our class one day, constitutional law, what was the biggest problem poor people had? And we made our comments as to what we thought the big problems were. And he said, the biggest problem is they don't read enough. Mm. And if they read more about the consequences of their actions, they wouldn't do the dumb stuff they do. Exactly. I agree. And I sat there and it was something so simple, but it's so impactful. So when I got involved, got on track, I knew that having students, young adults in our court system, getting their lives organized and trying to get that GED would help them down the road. Um, unfortunately, our jails are too full. Exactly. And um, there are still too many poor people getting caught up in the system today after our careers on the bench have um, seen some years behind them. And, um, but, but I'm glad you were there helping with Get On Track, and I knew you were utilizing that stuff oh, over yeah. at Juvenile Court. Oh, definitely. Um, what do, what's the future for Juvenile Court? Any, any, any programs coming up? What you? The, the Intervention Center that I, I spoke about, that, that's one new thing that we're doing. Um, let's see. Uh, we, there, there's always some new mentoring program. That, that's out there that is trying to grasp the attention of these of the young people. Uh, I'm gonna, I was, I, I believe at the beginning of um, the new year, I wanna start um, just um, a program where I go and talk to young African American males because the, there was uh, an opportunity for uh, individuals to be a part of an apprenticeship program and, a, and an individual came to me and they said the problem that we have is that you know, the African-American males who we want to be a part of this program, they aren't eligible because of the convictions that they have. And uh, a lot of it is because they just don't know about the consequences for certain behaviors. Uh, and so it was, um, um, you know, uh, a decision to, to maybe go out and talk to them beforehand, before these issues um, crop up to give them um, um, education on uh, what the consequences are and opportunity, alternative ways of, um, of uh, developing their, their, their lives. And so that's, that's something that, you know, that I want to do that is a part of the juvenile court but also separate from it as well. Um, we have um, really dedicated judges uh, who want to try to find alternative ways of um, helping individuals as opposed to just locking them up, uh, locking the kids up. Because what people don't realize about juvenile court, the reason why it was created was to rehabilitate kids. I mean, that's in the preamble uh, for the creation of the, program, of the, of the court um, and to put uh, wayward young people on uh, a positive path and not to confine them. And there, that pendulum has swung, you know, over the years from uh, about rehabilitation to confinement, back to rehabilitation to confinement. And now I think there's a balance there where egregious behavior, okay, yeah, we need to protect the community. Uh, but for the most part, most of the kids aren't committing those egregious acts and we need to find a way to rehabilitate them because we as a juvenile court only have them until 21. Uh, and they're gonna be out in the community. <laughs> we wanna be able to, we wanna be able to have young people who have um, the ability to be productive members in our community. Well, keep doing what you're doing. Thank I appreciate you. you. It's been a good conversation today. 
Uh, thank you also for being here and tuning into this episode of Cleveland Honors. And remember, as Booker T. Washington once said, success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life, as by, but by the obstacles which he has overcome. So long, everyone. Thank you.